All right, good morning. So here we are for yet another lovely day of MENG 3310 uh, Fluid Mechanics. So we have a few uh, lesson objectives for today. This is going to be the sixth lecture in this series. And first I wish to describe both Archim uh, uh, describe Archimedes' principle of buoyancy. Then I wish to uh, uh, apply Archimedes' principle of buoyancy to compute the buoyant force on objects. And three, explain the difference between center of gravity and center of buoyancy. So let us consider buoyancy, flotation, and stability. That's really what we're trying to get at today. Buoyancy, flotation, and stability. Now, um, objects in fluid will experience a buoyant force. We realize this. We know this. Um, if we place an object in a fluid, we can feel that, say, if I have a um, even something that will sink in water, if I hold it in the air and then hold it submerged in water, um, I can feel a lighter force. And the reason that force feels lighter is because of the buoyant force. So there is some sort of, we know intuitively that there is some sort of, um, that there must be some sort of upward or vertical force um, produced on objects that are immersed in a fluid. Okay, so buoyancy, flotation, and stability. Okay, so let us consider an object that is floating in a fluid. And the way I'm going to draw it, it will have a, um, it will be lighter than water or, the, or whatever fluid this could be immersed in. I mean, actually, since I'm not really, I'm not, we are not constraining our analysis to water, um, this could actually be a chunk of iron, even if it was floating in mercury or something like that. Although we don't tend to have things floating in lakes of mercury, but I suppose if that's what floats your boat, Oh wait, if that's what floats your boat. Uh, 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 uh. I'm so sorry. Okay, so we're gonna have some object here. And I'm just going to draw it as a cylinder for um, simplicity for simplicity's sake. And let us let's explore what buoyancy is. And this object is going to have a um, peak height or a top height and, an, and a bottom height. So let's say there is an H1 and an H2 here, an H1 and an H2, and there is a fluid surface here. And so this thing is suspended in the fluid and it is partially um, submerged. This object in turn will have both a density and a mass. So I'm gonna give it a rho and an M, a density and a mass. That's a rho and an M. This object has some rho and M. And then let's, I want to sort of draw a vertical, uh, I want to draw a free body diagram of the vertical forces. That's what really, what's really what I'm getting at here. There are a few things on that. First of all, there is going to be atmospheric pressure pushing down if we're working with absolute pressures here. So F1 would be my atmospheric pressure. Then pushing up, I'm going to have some sort of um, buoyant force. I'm going to have F2 or actually, actually, I shouldn't say buoyant force. I should just say a pressure force. So I'm going to have an F2 from um, P2. I'm going to ignore horizontal forces because um, they're, they are going to all be in balance at a given height, especially, if, especially if this is actually a cylinder. And then the third force is going to be the actual weight of the object, mg, pulling down. So these forces must be in balance. Then let me label two other things. I'm going to let um, H, not a subscript H, just not a subscript H, just H, be the actual uh, sort of depth in the fluid. And then I'm going to have L, which will be the overall length of the object. So H is our submerged depth, and L is the actual physical length of the fluid, or sorry, actual physical length of the cylinder. So the properties of the cylinder, in other words, the properties of the cylinder uh, for the cylinder, and this could work for any type of object, but um, I'm going to work through a cylinder first because it's the easiest to explain. Um, the properties of the cylinder are going to be my cross-sectional area A, my density rho, my um, mass M, and my length. 
Meanwhile, the properties of the fluid. Well, I only gonna, I'm only going to be worrying about one property of the fluid, and that is simply its density. So rho of the fluid, oh, like so. Now, to float, we must need equilibrium. If, if this object is going to float, there must be some sort of equilibrium present. So um, F2 minus F1 is equal, uh, so um, F2 minus F1 minus Mg is equal to zero. Um, now, this F2 minus F1 here, this is going to be what we call our buoyant force. This is, this, both of these together must somehow resist the um, force of gravity. So we're gonna call those the buoyant force and I'm going to use the variable F sub B, FB. Um, then working through this, I'm gonna work through the equations of hydrostatic pressure to sort of um, tease out the relationship of buoyant force. FB is going to be F2 minus F1. So that's F2 minus F1. However, um, this is going to be equal to um, the A times P2 minus P1. So the pressure on the top surface, which will be atmospheric pressure, times the, the cross-sectional area is going to be equal to the, uh, sorry, the, the pressure on the top surface times its area is going to be equal to F1. The pressure on the bottom surface times the cross-sectional area is going to be equal to F2. And so all I'm doing is transforming the forces into areas and pressures. Um, then, um, however, let's see, if we're going to be using, um, say, um, if, but the difference here, the difference between the pressures, though, is simply going to be A times rho of fluid times GH, and this is from the hydrostatic pressure equation. So the um, difference in pressures at a depth is going to be, as we saw in the last two lectures, the difference in pressure through the depth of the fluid, or the depth of a fluid, is the density of the fluid times G times H. And um, let me do some annotations here. Let's see if we can sort of tease out a few more relationships here just via some annotations. This here, the P2 minus P1, this is going to be, uh, again, from, from Pascal's law. It's just a simple application of Pascal's law. And this A, but look here, this is kind of cool. The um, A times the density of the fluid times G times H. This should look familiar. This is a cylinder. And like any prismatic shape, um, the volume of it is going to be A times its height, and then times G times H, that's just the weight of the fluid displaced. So in other words, we can get the deeper relationship, which is that the buoyant force is going to be equal to mg, which is equal to the weight of the object, which is equal to the weight of fluid displaced. going to be equal to the weight of fluid displaced. Questions on that? Okay. Hopefully fairly straightforward. And if I, I can then combine this into a more uniform or more uh, uh, formally written out Archimedes principle, let me write that out here, Archimedes principle. Archimedes principle. Again, the buoyant force on an object, which will be upward, is going to be equal to the gamma of the liquid times the volume submerged.
buoyant force on an object is going to be equal to the specific weight of the fluid times the volume submerged. Um, so, and this applies for any object regardless of the kind of, of whatever shape it is. So if you have a, even just a generic kind of lumpy object, just a nice potato floating in the water, I'll draw. I draw a lot of potatoes in statics class. For those of you who may have been unfortunate enough to have me for statics. If you have a just generic object here, it's going to have a weight at its center of mass. There'll be some volume submerged. And if this object is going to float, the overall weight here must be equal to the volume of whatever is below the water line. And that's the basic idea. Um, now, if I were to write this a bit more out, I could say the buoyant force on an object on an object or acting on, I should say, acting on a body, acting on a body is equal to the weight of fluid displaced Um, and this force, the resultant of this force passes through the centroid of the fluid displaced. And this will be important when we start talking about stability in a bit. So it doesn't, um, it doesn't, this is crucial, it's, a, it's subtle but crucial. The buoyant force of, on a body, it does not act through the um, center of mass of the body. It doesn't necessarily actually act through the centroid of the body. It's going to act through the centroid of the fluid displaced. So it's, uh, if you have a body with a really, now if you have a, something like a cylinder or a sphere or a cube or something like that, a, f a fairly uh, simple shape, the, yes, the um, buoyant force would act right through the center of mass of the body. But for more complex objects, they, those, two, those two locations can actually be quite different. So that's where you start dealing with issues like um, stability and things like that. Now, um, I suppose I should tell the legend of Archimedes, and um, we'll see. Uh, well, it, it may be apocryphal, and it's a bit unknown how truly accurate it is. But uh, have you all heard the legend of Archimedes? The bathtub, yes, the famous Archimedes bathtub. Oh, okay, I'll tell the legend. Now, Archimedes, the ancient Greek mathematician, now I can't remember what city he was living in the time. Was it uh, Thebes, maybe, or some Thebes? Okay. Um, anyway, so uh, the local autocrat, the local um, king or whatever, who was ruling over the city, um, one day someone gave this king, this king, this king, uh, some, one day someone da gave this king as a form of tribute this very fancy golden crown. And um, the king was much, was much appreciative, but he was, he was a suspicious fellow, and he wanted to make sure that the crown was not, was genuine, in the sense that, well, I mean, he, oh man, I, I cannot draw, draw, draw a crown to save my life. I'm, I'm just going to draw it in plan view. Or sorry, an elevation view. So yeah, let's just let's just draw the crown like this. I, I cannot draw crowns to save my life. Okay, so yeah, we have this crown here, very pretty golden crown. In fact, you know what? Here we'll, we'll make it out of gold by making it yellow. Um, see, crown. Very good, very good artistic skills here. So the whole idea with this was it, it on the outside it looked like it was gold, but what the um, king wanted to be sure of was, hey, how do I know that this is actually legit? In other words, like how do I know this is? Yes, he could clearly see that on the outside of it it was coated in gold, but how does he know that, that maybe it's not like lead or iron or something like that that's just been you know coated in gold on the outside? So how might he? 
um, determine that. Now, yes, he could cut the thing in half and look inside of it, but then it's ruined and he can't wear it on his head and he may have ruined the nice gift that was actually given, given to him by this other kingdom or whatever, whoever gave it to him. And he, uh, so he went down to the, um, so, he, so nobody can figure, nobody in the court could figure out how we can actually determine whether the crown is, um, is solid gold or not without destroying it. And so finally he went down to the, he, he had asked Archimedes. Archimedes was kind of um, in, in, in the city at the time. Archimedes was the equivalent of the Einstein. He was sort of, everyone regarded him as, the, he was famous in, even in his own time. Everyone knew about him. So, you know, if we can't figure it out, let's ask the smartest guy in town, literally. Um, so we'll make Archimedes do it, and if we if he can't figure it out, I guess I, and if he can't figure it out, well, I guess we'll just hang him. Well, um, it was you know ancient Greece, but uh, or the ancient world. So anyway, so he was so Archimedes got to work trying to figure out how he can um, solve this, and you know he had a lot riding. I don't know if he I don't know if he was actually threatened with execution, but knowing the ancient world, it wouldn't surprise me. Um, and so he had this crown. He was trying to figure out how he could. Um, determine if it was gold or not. Now, the easiest way would simply be to measure its density because gold is an unusually dense element. Uh, there is really nothing that's as dense as gold, um, especially in the, the, so in the in the modern world, we have some materials, some rare elements that are a little bit denser than it, some, something like uranium or something bizarre like that. But in the ancient world, that gold is really the densest thing you're ever going to find. And they did know the density of the gold. It, 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 to, they can always measure the density. They, they knew of the concepts like density. You just t take the weight of something, divide by its volume, very simple, although they would probably be working with more like a specific weight than density. Um, they wouldn't really, they probably wouldn't distinguish between density and specific weight. They were probably working more specific weight. But anyway, um, so they were really trying to just measure the specific weight of this object. And um, he, Archimedes knew that if he could confirm the specific weight of the um, crown was the same as gold, he knew that would be gold all the way through. He would, if he found that the, the uh, specific weight of the crown was less than gold, he would know that inside there somewhere was iron or uh, or lead or some other material, and that the uh, kings, um, that the people who had given this crown to the king had cheated them, and then the king would be very angry. And if he uh, measured that the specific weight was more than gold, then something would be very very wrong. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't think that we had to worry about that. Um, so fine, so um, he could measure, so in order to measure the specific weight of the crown, he needs two things. Obviously gamma um, here, it, so again, the goal is to measure spe the specific weight or the gamma. And this is of course going to be equal to the weight over the volume. Now, weighting, weight is easy, you just put it on a scale. That's just, that's, scales are used all the time in commerce. He probably had a dozen of them in his attic. This is not a very difficult thing to get. So he can measure the weight of the crown. It's not, it's not a large or particularly heavy object. Measuring its weight to a high accuracy for Archimedes is nothing, it's trivial. Um, measuring the volume, though, that's a trickier matter. See, the, trip, the trouble, of course, is that it's not a regular object. If it was a nice cube or something, you could just measure the length and the width of the height. And, you know, if, you, if, you, if the person had given the um, king a, a cube of gold, sure, you could measure that. But a crown, I mean, that's a very regular shape. How do you measure the volume of something like that? So one day, legend goes that Archimedes was uh, sitting in a bathtub. Well, I'm gonna, it looks more like an above-ground pool, but a bathtub. <laughs> and so... Um, what he was doing was, and I'm not going to draw a naked Archimedes because I don't want to. Um, so you have the fluid in the bathtub. And what he noticed was that every time he immersed this crown in the fluid, that the water level of the, of the bathtub would rise. So he noticed that it, was, he, it, wasn't, it wouldn't have been a very large effect because the, you know, the volume of the crown relative to the bathtub was small. But if he used, say, a smaller container, um, he could say, he, the, the insight that he realized was that the volume of water, the volume of water displaced is equal to the volume of the crown. And the nice thing about crowns is, the nice thing about gold is, it's not going to be damaged by water, so you can immerse that in water all day. And so all you have to do is, uh, a bathtub wouldn't be an ideal measuring device for this, but he can just go and get a bucket or something like that, a nice small container that the crown will just fit in. And, you know, if he knows the, wow, that is really bad even for me. I cannot draw crowns crown. <laughs> Problem solved. Labeling. Um, anyway, so you can measure the volume or the, the he, if, it, if it's a nice sort of, uh, say, a cylindrical vessel or something like that, it, that would be very easy to measure 
Um, all you have to do is measure the change in height, and you can very easily measure the change in volume. And from that, you can measure the volume of the crown. So he was just playing with, playing with this in his bathtub, measuring this. Uh, or he was just playing with this, immersing it up and down like a child would in the bathtub. And all of a sudden, in a flash of insight, it hit him. And he was so just so thrilled by this prospect. He was so enraptured and captivated by this that he... He leapt up out of the bathtub, didn't put any clothes on, went running out the door and right down the street shouting, Eureka, Eureka, which is Greek for I have it. And so that's how um, Archimedes ended up running down the streets buck naked. But anyway, and that is the legend of Archimedes. Whether it's true or not, well, that's been lost to the sands of time. So um, let's look at an example, a, a simple example of something like an iceberg. So let's work with an example of something like an iceberg. Iceberg. Now, we could really get into the details of the density of ice versus the density of uh, we could we can get into, we could quibble on details about the density of salt water and things like that, but I'll use some simpler values just to keep things kind of moving relatively quickly. So say you have a surface of a fluid here, and you have water and ice. And we know from experience, well, I don't know if many of you have experience with icebergs, I, know, I don't, but maybe some of you do. But um, you can, you know from just playing with ice, or from just having ice cubes in a glass, the majority of the volume of a piece of ice, whether it's a small cu ice cube or a giant iceberg, is going to be below the water line. So um, let's work through some properties here. And ice, well, let's say the density of ice is going to be 0 0.92 grams per cubic centimeter. And from Archimedes' principle, that's a, that's that a three, that's really bad. Um, per cubic centimeter, and then from Archimedes' principle, well, from Archimedes' principle, the um, weight displaced in water, weight displaced, the weight of displaced water is going to be equal to the buoyant force which must be equal to the weight of the ice. So whatever volume of water is below the wa is, is being displaced by the ice below the water line, um, times its density will be equal to the buoyant force, et cetera, et cetera. So working through this, um, gamma water times G times volume submerged is equal to um, the rho of the um, ice times G times volume of total ice. So the total volume of the ice. Again, this here is going to basically, this side of the equation is basically going to be the weight of the fluid displaced or the weight of the water displaced. And this thing over here, everything on this side of the equation is the, vol is the weight of the iceberg itself. And interestingly enough, what will happen here is that G cancels out. So um, one thing to kind of pay attention to or a neat thing to know is uh, uh, G cancels out, which what does that mean? Any, any idea what the implications of that would be? Force yes, the force, this is independent of the acceleration due to gravity. In other words, like uh, one thing I love to do on some of my exams sometimes is, especially on cases where it cancels out, is to like just put really random things like, uh, give you a buoyancy problem, but then say, oh, it's in a dome on a, it's under a dome on the surface of the moon or something really weird like that. I, I love doing things like that because, you know, we, when people see that, they're just, you know, flummoxed by it. But a lot of times it's, you know, if you work through the math, the G cancels out, and so it's kind of neat. Um, but anyway, um, on the on the final last semester, there was a drag problem involving throwing a automobile out of an airplane. But anyway, that was fun. Um, okay, so if I were continue to work through this here, 
V submerged over V total. Basically, I'm just going to solve for these uh, via ratios. And I didn't really have a given here, but it basically I'm looking for the ratio of the volume submerged, etc. So the total volume is going to be equal to rho of ice. I know it looks like a P. Rho of ice over uh, rho of water equals 0 0.92 grams per cubic centimeter over 1.0 1, 1 grams per cubic centimeter, or 0 0.92. So that's the volume submerged over the total volume. So therefore we can conclude that 92% of the iceberg's total volume is below the waterline or underwater. And this is how you can think about um, this is why historically icebergs are so dangerous. Now, occasionally you will see a um, an iceberg sinking a ship nowadays, but really nowadays it doesn't happen that often. We have a little better tools like radar and things like that on, on sh large ships, but occasionally it may happen. But it, at least historically, icebergs were a much greater hazard. And nowadays it, we ha you know we have things like aircraft and satellite. They can spot. Uh, um, iceberg flows from a great distance away, even from orbit, things like that. But in historic periods, we didn't really have any way of detecting icebergs from a long distance, except, so if you were in the, the Titanic or something like that, if you were piloting the Titanic in, um, in the 1910s, the only way to detect an iceberg was to have somebody on the top of a tall mast um, physically on the ship with a pair of binoculars looking for icebergs. That was the only way to find them. And this can also be the danger because um, these things can be quite large, and sure, if the iceberg was a nice cylinder, it wouldn't be a problem. As long as you know, if the, if the if the iceberg was shaped like this, that wouldn't be a problem. You just got to make sure to not put your boat, you know, at the top of the cylinder, and you'll be fine. If you have your ship like this here, I cannot draw boats. There is a nice Titanic. If the iceberg was a convenient cylinder, this wouldn't be a problem. But um, it tends not to work so well that way because um, icebergs, they don't tend to, they, don't, they tend to be regularly shaped. And if you have an iceberg that is sort of pear-shaped or something, well, when we get to stability, if you have something that is sort of bulbous, if you have something kind of pear-shaped or something, it's not gonna float like this. Um, the heavier part is gonna be on the bottom. It's gonna be more like this. The heavier part is going to naturally try to dr uh, try to sit at the bottom. It's this, this shape floating in water is more stable than this shape. So if you have your iceberg though, if, if it's a particularly flared iceberg, that's where it can get really dangerous. So say your iceberg is kind of, maybe there's just a little bit sticking over the water and you have something like this. Then you can have real problems because if your ship is like this, it may be clearing your ship may be clearing the iceberg, the part of the iceberg that's at the surface, but there is a protrusion underneath the water that you can't see. And so um, that's why historically icebergs have always been so sort of uh, dangerous, is that you can't just, you know, put, it's, it's not as simply as a matter of, oh, the part that you see, just don't put your ship, just make, don't make sure, just make sure your ship doesn't hit that. There could be a part below the water that you can't see. And so that's historically one of the reasons icebergs have been so dangerous. Although part of that also is that um, especially at night, you can't see these things from really far away if, unless you have modern instruments. And if you have a major, major giant ocean liner with thousands of people on board, well, and you're on water, it takes, you thought it took, take a long, it, you thought it took a long distance to stop a train, you should try stopping an ocean liner. So it takes a long time to steer the, long distance to steer these things. It can take many, many miles for these to turn out of the way. Um, again, let's look at, say, density versus volume. Another sort of subtlety here. Density and volume. Let's look at the density of fluids and the density of um, solids versus the um, buoyant force. So let's go back to a simple cylinder model and look at how things develop. Here.
here. And then I'll have a fluid surface somewhere below this. And now I'm going to use the same L and H that I did before. So L being the overall length of the object, and H being just the depth of the object submerged. Okay. So working through, I'm just going to work through some equations of equilibrium and then look at what this um, produces, look at some implications of this. So the buoyant force is going to be equal to the weight of the object. Buoyant force must be equal to mass times the acceleration due to gravity. And then working through this again, um, density of fluid, rho fluid, times A, um, H, times G, where AH is going to be the volume submerged. Um, let me finish writing this, and I'll annotate, then I'll annotate it. Times A um, rho cylinder times L. So let me sort of annotate this a bit. Although I'll put this one in parentheses here. Uh, L times my G, need my G. Now, let's annotate this a little bit. AH, this is going to be again the volume submerged. That's how I got that AH. Um, A times L, that would be the volume, um, the total volume of the object. And this here would be the mass of the object. Now, um, we know that if um, cylinder is floating, Uh, H must be less than L. H is less than L. <coughs> and um, therefore, we can actually use this to sort of uh, hint at density. So since H is less than L, um, and the basically let's um, sort of look at things that will cancel out here. The, the A, the G, and the G will cancel out. So I'm going to have A fluid times H, or sorry, rho fluid times H is going to be equal to rho cylinder times L, assuming a constant cross-sectional area. So, um, or in other words, I can say that if rho if fluid, if it's going to, if this thing is going to float, H must be less than L, or um, if rho fluid is greater than rho cylinder, this thing will float. If rho fluid is less than rho cylinder, then it will sink. And then this, you know, um, this is pretty intuitive. We should know that, I mean, it makes sense that if an object is denser than the fluid, it will sink. But, you know, it's, it's nice to see this developed mathematically. So we know that pebbles sink, so for example, pebbles sink um, because rho is greater than rho w, and wood floats because rho is less than rho w. And you know this intuitively, but it's nice to see where, where mathematically this actually comes from. So, and additionally, independent of an object's dimensions, density is what ultimately will determine whether an object um, will float. Ultimately, only density matters. Now, um, here's a question though. Um, how does this work? So if, if only density matters, how does an iron ship float? Mm. So yes, it displaces a huge amount of volume. So if density is all that matters, How does a steel ship float? The specific weight of steel is approximately 490 pounds per cubic foot, while the gamma of water is approximately 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. Obviously, 
um, the density of steel is going to be much, much greater than the density of water. Yet we can actually produce ships um, out of steel. We you know, so if I take a steel ingot, throw it in the ocean, it's just going to sink all the way to the bottom. But we can make ships out of steel. And why is that? Because it's not just the density that matters. It is the average density that matters for complex objects. The average density is what matters. So in other words, if you have a, um, a say a ship, I'll, I'll use the example of a ship. Here, I have a certain fluid surface here. And say we have a ship with a keel here and all this kind of stuff. If you look at it from the side, you know, maybe looks, there's my really poorly drawn ship. Um, yes, the walls would be steel walls, and they would be very heavy. But if you took the uh, total weight and divided by the total volume, this would be less than 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. It's that it, it's made it's a, a part of that um, average weight is going to be a lot of air. That's going to be a lot, there's going to be a lot of air in it, and it's going to um, make it so that the overall um, specific weight of this thing is much less than the specific weight of water. So um, be mindful of that. Uh, there will be some examples where, or some problems where I might ask you to find the, the whether, a, whether a compound object uh, floats or sinks. I remember on the first exam last year, I kind of flummoxed some, or last semester, I kind of flummoxed some students when I told them that th I had a, um, there was a steel shell and it was full of, um, it was full of like some weird dense gas like radon and it was floating in a fluid, it was like floating in a lake of oil or something like that. And they had to calculate the average density of the thing and compare of this complex object, well relatively complex, a, a thin steel shell um, surrounding a gas and then floating in a, a fluid that's other than water. And the way you do that is that you add up you, the, uh, you, add, you find the total weight of the gas and the shell divide by the total volume, and that's you find the average density of the compound object. And you compare that to the average density of the fluid. If it's great, if the average density of the, of the object is greater than water, or greater than the fluid, it will sink. If it's less, then it will float. All right, and I think that will do it for today. Today, I really just wanted to introduce Archimedes' principle and basic concepts of buoyancy. All right, so uh, uh, that, that, that'll do it for today, and as always, thank you. <laughs>